Hi, I'm Lord Layton. I'm the director of children's ministry here at River of Life Baptist Church. I wanted to tell you about a cool project that we're doing here at River of Life. We've been doing Teen Kid for seven years, um, bringing children from Jesse May Monroe to River of Life Baptist Church where they participate in Bible studies. Um, this year we're doing, or this semester, we're doing Teen Kid at Home. And along with Bible studies, we decided to purchase meals for these families, one meal per week. So as you see, we've got um, taco soup, a chicken dinner. Then we've also got spaghetti and hamburger helper. These meals are for parents to hopefully get involved with the children and cook um, meals with them and maybe talk about the Bible lesson. Um, we're asking for donations to help provide meals for the teen kids' children. Um, we've asked for $35 a month for the month of March and the month of April. Thank you for those who have already given the money, um, but we would like more donations. We did have extra children sign up, so we would um, like more donations if at all possible. If you can't do the $35, if you could just give anything to help purchase these meals for the children. The meals you see before me, which is for four, um, can say, uh, four meals on Mondays, um, come up to a little over $20. I think we spent around $20, $21 on all this food. So they will have to purchase the meat and the dairy products to go with this food, but we've got all the staple items um, to go with that. Um, this Teen Kid at Home um, hopefully is going to expand, and next year we're planning on doing Teen Kid back here at River of Life Baptist Church. Um, if you will, um, just see Sheila or myself, or if you'd like to write a check, just put Teen Kid in the memo. Um, again, it's $35 a month or whatever you can afford. Thank you. It's quite a hurdle for her. <clears throat> but wasn't she awesome? Wasn't that a fantastic job? I think she's uh She's turned over a new leaf, and I'm so uh, so proud of her. She did a great job with that. Thank you so much for her work with Teen Kid. Uh, so much goes on behind the scenes that we don't uh, we don't know about that from Sunday to Sunday. So this was uh, very apropos, if you will, and I appreciate it. Another thing, uh, our parking lot guy is back, Rhett, and uh, Rhett just wanted uh, me to extend. Um, a thanks from his heart for all our prayers and everything that we've been doing on his behalf while he's uh, gone through a battery of tests and some episodes. But he's here feeling good, and uh, if you see him outside or on your way out or back in, uh, be sure to, uh, to greet him with that. But he is so thankful and just wanted uh, me to express that on his behalf. So, Rhett, we appreciate Rhett as well. The title of today's sermon is The Cup That Cuts. And it may be perhaps that uh, you look at that and say, man, I wonder where he's going with this. But hopefully by the end of it all, you're going to understand even more about just how deep God's Word is and how it all ties together and points to the cross. So as we look at that today, um, our text, you can go ahead, and in your bulletins, by the way, uh, rather than having you guys uh, fumble through your Bibles and, and search and search and search, uh, We've tried to make it convenient for you. These are extra passages that we're going to be referring to as well today. Uh, so they're there for your convenience that you might uh, just be able to pull them out, look at them, and go home and, uh, and study them some more as, uh, as you look even further, more deeply into, into God's Word. This is the fourth installment, if you will, of the final countdown. If you haven't been with us, but as I look around, most of you have, you know that the last three weeks, this being the fourth week, has been a crescendo, if you will, the last week of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, only being able to enumerate some of the events that surrounded his, uh, his vigil, if you will, his walk to the cross of Calvary. We know that um, the first one we did was your king has arrived. It was about the uh, going and getting the donkey that was tied up as he mentioned that it would be, he told his disciples that very truth and how they could believe uh, that whatever he said was, uh, was actually going to come to pass because he precedes us in all that he does. The second installment was that brokenhearted love. You remember the great commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And as we looked into that, we also the depths of, we saw the depths of God's love and it maybe uh, became even a greater reality to us just how that, what that looks like 
and how that should be played out, if you will, or acted out in our own community. Last week we talked about Mary and the alabaster box. Do you remember the perfume that he poured? She poured out over his head, without reservation, and that extravagant. Uh, act of worship from her and how perhaps and hopefully that's changed our perspective maybe even you've thought about this week of how your perspective of worship might be changed somewhat today our study brings us to Thursday Thursday in the week of Jesus Christ the Passover week so many things occurred this week that there's just not enough room to go into all of them the sit that we look at today, the scene is, here's this city of Jerusalem celebrating the week of Passover and now they're going as families to participate and partake in that Passover meal. Thursday's the day of preparation. Remember, there were hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of people here. Some Bible scholars would even say there could have been up to two million people within the city walls of Jerusalem. Men within 15 miles of the city were required to be there, but we know throngs of people came from all over for this celebration. Don't we look forward to things like that in our own lives? Don't we look forward to those reunions, those times that we can spend with family, Christmas, Thanksgiving, whatever it may be, and we get excited about that because we remember what it's been like. Even in our childhood, even in uh, recent history, we know those things to be very special to us, so we look forward to those things. Well, these people were not unlike us. They were looking forward to that time of celebration with their family. They were looking forward to some uh, fantastic uh, a meal, some wine, some fellowship, and the things that they so dearly cherished in their hearts. Passover starts on the 15th day of Nisan in the Hebrew calendar and lasts for seven or eight days, usually in April. That's why we celebrate it at the time of year that we do. For those of you that haven't ever figured out why Easter skips around so much, if you'll listen, it is the first Sunday after the first full moon after the solstice. So we know March 21st, okay? So that's how we can have Easter as early as the latter part of March or even into the uh, middle weeks of April. So that's how that all works out. So here, here we are. We're preparing for this Passover meal. And we look at Mark 14, verses 10 and 11, and we recognize that Judas had done what? He had schemed with the church leaders, if you will. He had schemed with them so that he might turn Jesus over into their hands. Most believe this event began sometime on Thursday morning. For Jesus, the clock is ticking. The time, his time has come. So with that, please stand with me, if you will, and let's read uh, Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 25, as we honor God's word with its reading. And the scripture tells us, on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room? Where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. And he will show you a large room, upper room, furnished and ready. There prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening... He came with the twelve, and as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread in the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes, it is written on him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took the bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave to them. And he said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, 
which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. You may be seated. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we need you today so desperately. Father, I need you. I pray so desperately, God, that you would breathe a breath of freshness in this room, in and through the power and the essence of your Holy Spirit, Father, that it might remove the junk and the clutter out of our lives, raise the fog, so that we might see you even more clearly. Lord, our prayers today that we might see you on that Thursday. That Thursday when so much was going on. But Lord, may we also experience the fullness of your presence in such a way that we leave here today simply overwhelmed. God, as we read in Scripture in Revelation 5, 11 through 14, it tells us, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. To receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Verse 12 tells us that this was the first day of unleavened bread when they killed the Passover lamb. Did the twelve, do we think that they had any idea whatsoever of what was about to take place? You know, this was a rich time for them. They were not unlike us. They were not like any of the others. They wanted to go to have this time of celebration. They had done it, we know, at least two times prior, maybe a third time, but they had come to this place again, and as it was their routine, as it was customary, they said, okay, Lord, where are we eating tonight? Where are we going to hang out? Where are we going to spend this time together and share a meal? You see... What they didn't realize was this was about to be the Passover of all Passovers. We look at verse 13. And it says, And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. You see, don't we remember it was just a few days prior that a request like this was made as well? Jesus said to the disciples, Take two of you. Go into the city, go and find a colt tied. Take the keys to the car, they'll give it to you because I need it. Remember? How is this unlike that? As we look at it, it's not. His disciples, even in spite of themselves, had learned to depend and take what he says to be the truth. They could trust him. They could trust him in all things. They could trust him in the details. Go find a man. Maybe two million people. The throng was there. Think about it. There were probably 250,000 lambs inside the city walls of Jerusalem. But amid the chaos, Jesus had gone before them, made sure that the details were taken care of, find a man with a water pot on his head. Now, why is this significant? Because men didn't carry water pots on their head. This man was the needle in the haystack for us, but not for Jesus. He had picked him out and made him somewhat easy for the circumstances to be fulfilled because his disciples needed to locate this guy. And, you know, I can't, because I guess it's me. I would have said, Are you kidding me? Really? Lord, you just, hadn't you seen all the people that are around? How are we going to find this guy? He said, just do it. I got it taken care of. The promise we find here is that if you're looking for guidance in your life, 
You can trust him in the details. You don't have to look any further. You can, you can trust him in all your decisions, not just part of the time, but all the time, and you can do so perfectly. Well, this man was carrying this uh, pitcher of water on his head. Most Bible scholars would believe that this was the father of John Mark, the writer of this gospel. Maybe they used that room before. We don't know. But as we learn about this and we begin to absorb this, the focus changes because John tells us in chapter 13 that he washed the disciples' feet before the Passover supper. So what was his lesson here? They found the room just like he said it was going to be. Next thing he does, he takes a basin of water and a pitcher and he goes around to each of them and washes their feet. Now why is this significant? Well, you say, well, because he's, you know, he's just displaying his servanthood. Absolutely. But what was so out of whack about this whole thing is because Jews just didn't do that. They had Gentiles typically in the house or servants that would wash the feet of the guests that would come in. So Jesus not only displayed his servanthood, he took his humility and he placed it before everybody in the house. But see, his service was much greater than just washing their feet. What they were going to soon learn, if it hadn't dawned on them already, that he was going to serve them not only by washing their feet, but by washing their sins away on a cross. As we look at verse uh, 18, the dynamics begin to change even more. And it says, as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And they began to be sorrowful and say to him one after another, is it I? These chosen men of his were all wondering if they were the betrayer. Not a single one of them declared, no way, Lord, it's not me. Pay attention to what's not said when you read scripture as well. Wouldn't we have wanted to stand up and say, oh, hey, must be somebody else. I couldn't possibly be guilty of this. I couldn't possibly be accused. I couldn't possibly qualify as a betrayer. But it wasn't mere speculation on their part as to their propensity to betray. It was their conviction because of the sin and depravity in their own lives that they were each fully capable of being a betrayer. Don't miss that. Everybody in the room qualified. We find out and we try so many times. We pin it on Judas and say, I can't believe he did that. Yet all the disciples in the room knew that they each one could have possibly done it. You know what? I betray him every day in some form or fashion. I too, as all of us would, if we were in the room, we could raise our hand and say, yep, I could be the one. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Well, the only one that can understand, and the answer to this rhetorical question is the Lord himself. We can't get it. We'll never get it. We'll just benefit by it eternally. They couldn't understand it. Trust me, I can't understand it. Today we must come to grips again that we're all capable of. Verse 20. He said to them, It is one of the twelve who is dipping bread in the dish with me. Notice how even at this time, Jesus took the time as painstakingly as he washed Judas' feet knowing that he was going to be the one that betrayed him. Let me ask a question today. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to shout out a name. But think of the one who has betrayed you. Think of one who has done you wrong. Think of one that you really in your heart of hearts have a hard time coming to grips with the fact that you might just really not like him. You may love him, but you don't like him. 
Picture yourself on your knees washing the feet of that one. But I can promise you, when you bend down to wash the feet of one, that one wasn't going to turn you in. That one wasn't going to be premeditating your very murder. Judas did. And the fact that he went and he said, the one that I'm going to dip this sop in, what was happening here? When you took the sop of the bread and you put it in the bitter herbs and the wine and you dipped it there with your brother sitting around the table, you were telling them, this is the greatest fellowship of all. I love you. And yet, he identified Judas as the one who dipped the very sop with him as well. See, there were four cups of the Last Supper is on the screen. As was customary, they would take the wine, and the first cup, the first drink they would take was called the cup of sanctification. They would pass it around again. They would pray about it and pass it around again. The second one being the cup of remembrance. Not the remembrance of Jesus Christ. That comes later. But it's about remembering the bondage of Egypt and remembering how God delivered the nation of Israel from that. But here Jesus stops. As we read in Luke twenty two twenty, and I think you might have have that in your uh, notes. It says, And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, The cup is poured, that is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. We know that this was the third cup of four Passover cups. He's making an eternal proclamation here, guys, and this is where I want us to focus today. There's plenty to talk about in what we've just mentioned. But the focus today is one that I'm praying that you guys will hang on to because I promise you it will change Easter for you forever. Verse 24, there is now a new covenant. What does the term covenant mean? We would think rightfully so that a covenant is what? It's an agreement, right? It's a promise. It's a vow. We have a contract, so to speak. Take your notes out, and I want you to read with me Genesis chapter 5. It's 15, I'm sorry. Genesis chapter 15, beginning with verse 7. Where did all this start? Where did all this covenant start begin? Stuff begin? Well, it's right here. The very first book of the Old Testament. And the scene is set. God has just promised Abram that his descendants would be as the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore and that he was going to bless him unbelievably so and we pick it up at verse 7 and he said to them I'm the Lord who brought you out of, from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess but he said O Lord God this is at Abram saying, speaking now O Lord God how am I to know that I shall possess it he said to him bring me a heifer three years old a female goat three years old a ram three years old a turtle dove and a young pigeon, and he brought him all these. And listen to this, guys. He said, cut them in half. Cut them in half. Lay each half over against the other. But he didn't cut the birds in half, and when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now let's stop right here. This is a lot to take in. A lot to take in. But let our mind's eyes go there, and what he was telling Abram was customary, believe it or not. You see, when people would have a contract with one another, that's what they would do. They would make a sacrifice. It was that serious. So he says, take this three-year-old heifer, take the goat, and take a ram and cut them in half. Now, he didn't say split them. He said cut them in half. So if they're here, we've got the head over here, we've got the hindquarters over here, and there's a path in between. But it says the birds of prey came down on the carcasses and Abram drove them away. Let's pick up at verse 12. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. 
as 430 to be exact. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Verse 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and Rephaim, verse 21, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. You see, men who were dealing with one another would have walked down this carriageway of dead carcasses, bloody carcasses. It was gory, but this is what it meant. What it meant was, may what has been done to these beasts be done to me if I don't keep my word. Do we understand? In verse 8, Abram asked God, he said, how can I know, how can I know that this agreement you're entering in, into with me, how can I trust and know what you're doing, to, what you're going to fulfill? What's he saying to the Lord? He's saying, how can I believe you? How can I trust you? Remember, God referred to Abraham as one who had tremendous faith. God, how can I know that you're going to do what you say you're going to do? The Lord's saying, right, Abram, let's sign a contract today. Let me prove it to you. I'll sign a contract. Let's sign an agreement and settle this once and for all. If I don't honor my word, may I be rent asunder just like these beasts. Now, you Randall, man, why don't we go to Genesis to talk about Easter? You see, agreements today that we talk about, when we go to sign a contract today, it's a bilateral agreement. And somebody's got to do something for somebody else to do something else. That's what's called an agreement. But notice that this one's different. Why do you think he put Abram asleep or to sleep? He was almost in a coma. He rendered him null and void except for his eyesight. You see, God himself knew that this once and for all, he's saying, if I don't honor my word, may I be rent asunder. The thing that we've got to get today is that this was a unilateral agreement, an agreement for one. You see, God was the only party to this contract. He knew that Abram was incapable of keeping his part of the bargain. He knew before the foundations of the world that we were incapable of keeping the par our part of the bargain. Notice it didn't say, okay, Abram, if you pray three times a day, every day, and don't miss one, I'll do this. If you make sure you go to church three out of four times a week, I'll honor my end of it. And then later on when Moses comes along, instead of signing a contract in blood, it was written on a stone tablet and said, if you do all these things, it's all going to be okay. Notice that's not what he said. You might be wondering, Randall, what does this have to do with where we are today? I'm going to tell you something. It has everything to do with what we're talking about. Each of these animals foreshadow a distinctive aspect of Christ's person and his work. There's a heifer here, a three-year-old heifer, no less, and a heifer seems to indicate energy, a beast of bondage, a burden and work. The Lord Jesus Christ was a servant. We know this from Mark, from Isaiah, the suffering servant who came to do the Father's will. Then you're to take a three-year-old goat, 
The goat in the Old Testament is a sin offering. The Lord Jesus was coming to be a sin offering. Then they're to take a three-year-old ram, and the ram is in the Levitical offerings was connected with consecration. And Jesus is coming and consecrating himself, surrendering himself to the Father's will, which meant to be the cross. So what about these birds? Turtle dove and young pigeon. If we remember, they were often caged up in the marketplace in the temple so they could be purchased for a sacrifice to be offered during the Passover. Now you may be thinking, man, you're pushing things. You're getting out there on a limb. That's kind of stretching things now. But you need to understand, too, three times in this text, three times, it's repeated three years old and the Lord Jesus Christ offered himself after what? Three years of service as the servant of the Lord. What happens next is even further confirmation of a sovereign God's intentions. The typical contract was executed in this matter. We talked about it. Once the carriageway of carcasses was put together, the two signatories, the two parties to the contract would walk arm in arm together down the middle to say that they were agreeing with one another. Abram's waiting on God to show up. Why do you think the vultures were hanging around? Why do you think the birds of prey came and, and were covering the carcasses? Because time had passed. Abram was waiting for God to come. So what does God do? He comes in, he puts him to sleep. So what's that saying? Abram, this is going to have nothing to do with you. God's telling him, you don't have a single bit of say in this matter. This is a unilateral, unconditional covenant that God is going to keep in spite of man's cooperation. Isn't that where we are today? Aren't we so thankful today? Don't we owe our lives to the very fact that God keeps his end of the bargain. He's going to honor his word, and for that reason, when Abram was asleep, he saw this vision of the burning Shekinah glory that was walking between these carcasses. We see it here, it talks about the fire. That's the same fire that they traveled by, and the smoke that filled the temple. It was God's presence. It was God himself. You remember, Abram was not unaccustomed to the fact of God showing up. They talked. They spoke to each other as friends. But this was different. In verse 12, we read that God does something strange. It says, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. What happened at the ninth hour when Jesus himself was on the cross? There was darkness that covered the entire land. It wasn't just dark. I believe the sun stopped shining. A precursor of the cross is right here. The Hebrew noun emma, E-M-A, means dread, fear, horror, terrible terror. At this nighttime, or as this nighttime vision unfolds, Abram is surrounded by a terrifying darkness. In his coma-like state, Abram's darkness was the darkness of sin and his dreaded fear was the realization that there was no way, no way that he could uphold his end of the contract. His realization of helplessness is noted in verse 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these places. God's going to honor his word for that reason. When Abram was asleep, he saw this vision of the burning Shekinah light moving down on its own. God is moving down the middle. Saying, I'm going to do this for myself and for my glory. Even though, Abram, Abram you're going to become Abraham, and yes, I'm going to do all the things that I've told you I'll do. I'm going to fulfill my end of the bargain. My promises are real. My promises are true. But guess what? This is not about you. This is about me and my son. Abram's sleep is significant when we think of the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
It's all pointing forward to that great Passover lamb. The suffering that's imaginable, there's going to be the greatest sacrifice of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. This glory of God, this Shekinah glory, this fire, this smoke, God's presence passed through the blood and the sacrifice, guess what, alone. Without Abram, God did it all. Aren't we thankful today that he doesn't have to depend on us? Oh, my goodness. I'm so thankful. What do you think grace is? Think about it. Grace is the fact that we don't have to do a thing except open the gift. Receive it. But understand that this covenant wasn't just for the nation of Israel. It was for all of us. 2 Corinthians 5.18 tells us all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself. As Christians, we know the end of the story where God himself bears in the broken body of his innocent son the penalty for man's breaking of the covenant. You see, we broke it. It didn't take long. And in just another day, Darkness is again going to fill the land. God is going to walk through the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through His carnage and the bloodshed of His Son who was cut. He was crucified, the perfect sacrifice, the perfect lamb, and He will cry out, Tetelestai, it's finished. And, and we think and we know for sure that that truth is the sin debt has been paid in full. But I think there was more. I think God Himself was stepping onto the scene of all humanity in His creation and saying, this is enough. I don't want Him to take any more. As a father would for his child. But what the disciples didn't realize was when the bread and the cup was being passed around that there was not going to be a need for another Passover feast. This was it. Now we know that they've been taking place ever since. But really, the Passover land, if you look in Scripture, I will challenge you to find anywhere where it talks about the disciples actually partaking of the land. We know that it was uh, Jesus said, we'll get, you know, go prepare it. Or the disciples rather said, where do you want us to go prepare the land? Jesus didn't check to see if the fire was right. He didn't check to see if everything was roasted. He merely went there and had bread, his body, and, and the wine, his blood, as an example of the fact that they didn't need a lamb. The lamb was sitting right there among them. He was there. No need anymore. Those 250,000 lambs that were bleeding outside the door of this place, they were probably thinking, finally. No more. You know, perhaps you've been on Craigslist and found something you wanted to buy or been to the car lot and found a vehicle you'd been looking for and you come home and say, Man, they really cut me a deal. That's where it comes from. Bet you didn't know that. But you see, the deal for us was cut long, long ago. Not just the cross. That was the culmination of it. But the promise was made long before that. You know, we, we sing the old hymn, uh, the song, Jesus Paid It All. And I struggle with that a little bit. I, I, I get it. And it's a moving song. It's a beautiful hymn. But the one that paid the price was God himself. He paid for it by sacrificing his son. Jesus is the one that was punished. He was the one that suffered. He was the one that was beaten. But God provided the sacrifice. Oh, how he must love you and me. 
if you're not getting this whole thing, if you're not in awe and wonder about the whole thing, maybe it's my fault. Maybe I'm not getting it across. But please, please, my prayer is for each of you to get to that point in your life where we begin to realize even more and more of just exactly what was going on at Calvary. So much more than the pictures, so much more than the songs, we can't even begin to understand the cup that was cut, the new covenant. See, when people talk about the new covenant, we as Christians will stick our chest out and say, oh yeah, we're a New Testament church, we're a new covenant church. Man, we don't know what we're talking about. Yes, we are. But until we understand where that originated, until we understand where that came from, will we ever begin to understand what it means to be a New Covenant New Testament church? You see, God was cutting the covenant. For you on the flesh of his own son. And when Jesus passed the cup around that third time. They just couldn't have even begun to comprehend. What he meant when he said this is the cup of the new covenant. You have in your notes Hebrews 9. And this is what I believe Paul understood. He said he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now it's interesting how the Lord based the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper on the Passover practice, isn't it? But it's also equally interesting the things that he didn't use. You see, he only used the unleavened bread and the third cup. He didn't go to the fourth cup. We just looked at the fact we know there are four cups of the Passover. You see, that fourth cup that was omitted this time around is the cup of praise. It's called the Halil cup. But that's what Jesus was meaning when he said, I'll not drink of the fruit of the vine, I'll not eat again until my kingdom comes. I'll not partake of this. Because then there will be a time of praise. Then there will be a time of celebration. We just think we've been celebrating now. But when we get to heaven, when I get there, I'm going to drink the cup of praise because my daddy said, it's over, I didn't have to do this anymore. But you know what? We'll drink of it too. Those of you who know Christ and are sure that you're sure that you're sure that you're a blood-bought believer in Jesus Christ, you've asked him to come into your heart. And reside there. Doesn't scripture tell us that he will make all things new? Hmm. My prayer is that when we dare, and I mean that so humbly and respectfully, but when we dare look at the cross of Calvary. May we never look at it again without seeing what actually was taking place, without trying to understand. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would He devote His sacred head for such a worm as I? He did. He did. May we never, ever get over that. Yet may we always celebrate. 
We can't rejoice in an empty tomb until we understand where it all started. But praise God, we can. I'm going to ask you to stand as we close. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. And as is every Sunday, every time we gather together, this altar is open. It's not a condition of worship, but it's an availability of worship. If there's anybody here that just wants to come and say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Come right here. In your seat. Lift your prayer of praise to Him, knowing that you're going to celebrate with Him with that fourth cup one day. If there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, may this be the time. If you need to come, rededicate your life, bring someone here to pray. You're one, you're two, you're three, you're four. Come do that as we worship.